They slow burn with fire. Okay. Good. Um, okay. So I'm Anony Marcus from uh, Chaos Computer Club Switzerland, board member and spokesperson. And we are obviously, if you look into the media, we are fighting uh, e voting in Switzerland. Um, we do this event here together with uh, Kritische Politik, that's a left wing platform at the University of Zurich, where also Timothy Schurman, who registered this event, we thank you a lot. We'll say a little bit more about it. And then, we, of course, we have Sarah Jane Lewis here, who uh, completely destroyed the Swiss Post or the Skype e voting system, which helped us a lot. Uh, and in that context, it's also very important to say that we have like signature sheets here to sign the, the e voting moratorium. So we propose uh, to stop e voting for at the very least uh, five years. Uh, so it would be needed to show that it's as secure as paper voting, basically, which, uh, as Sarah can truly say, is very hard to achieve. Of course, there are also issues with paper voting, but. Uh, what concerns scalability and impersonation issues, I think uh, it's uh, difficult to compare. So please uh, sign that. We also have Nicolas Rimoldi here. Where is he? There. Uh, he is uh, one of the leaders of this campaign, so just talk with him if you want to know more. Uh, yes, and that's it. So uh, what concerns the case with the club? So we are a hacker organization from civil society. It started in the 1980s in Germany. And we also um, constructed one here in Switzerland by 2012 in a federated forum. Before that, there was already CC Zurich and in Basel, there were already um, uh, uh, such organizations. And uh, we are not dependent from interests of the state or from economy. So we are from civil society, quite left wing mostly, but well, uh, very anarchistic in general. It's difficult to say. <laughs> But um, yeah, well, so we just look at things and, and uh, if we see something which is like, uh, if we see things which go th towards centralization or towards mass surveillance, we, we, we fight it. Uh, it's very difficult, but I think um, uh, through these Cambridge Analytica things and stuff, uh, um, awareness is, is, is being raised. And uh, with Sarah Jamie Lewis, we also have someone here from the Open Privacy Foundation of the Net and based non profit. Um, um, uh, organization uh, which also um, is about to create a decentralized network, so going in the right, the right direction. So systems which are censorship resistant, uh, resistant and um, uh, resistant to mass surveillance. So that's the direction we need to take. And because she helped us a lot and she's doing really great stuff, uh, which, we, which uh, she will tell us, uh, we call for donations. So we have like three boxes here, um, there, there, and there. And you can just put in money, or you can also go to, I think, openprivacy.ca slash donate, and also use cryptocurrency or whatever. Please give her money so that she can continue <laughs> her great work. Um, she, she, she received only 2,500 francs from Swiss Post, which is absolutely hilarious if you know that they uh, gave Skype to the Spanish company like millions, so that's uh, in no relation. Um, that's the very least we can do here in Switzerland to say uh, thank you. Well, and uh, now uh, Timothy can say something on Triple. Yes, we are a student organization here at the University of Zurich and partly also on ETH over the street. And um, we are like a broader group where different um, spectrums of left have their place in our organization. And we make politics uh, in university and um, also outside. We have um, some material over there on the table. Uh, feel free to take whatever it interests you. And now I just quickly want to make uh, two announcements. And on the 14th of November, we will have the Long Enough the Critique, um, which is a counter event to the Long Night of Careers. So we, <laughs> <laughs> we um, speak about uh, this idea of um, directing one's studies towards a career and um, about um, critical um, education such things 
on the 14th of November and tomorrow um, at 4.30 p.m. on the Hilfsa Platz. There will be the strike for Kurosawa, um, where Turkey has attacked, and um, a demonstration against this war, and also um, the feminist strike and the climate strike are calling for the strike tomorrow. So be there. I want to say something more. Um, this event is being live streamed into the internet by the CCC Zurich um, to YouTube for scalability reasons, not for privacy reasons, <laughs> for sure not. Um, you find it at the, if you, if you look up for the uh, CCC Switzerland account, so um, CCC underline CH, that's the handle. Um, there one with the ad before, perhaps. Uh, you can uh, find the link there and yeah, retweet it so people who are not here can, can uh, see that uh, live. And uh, that also means that, of course, the heads from behind might be recorded. So if you don't want your face um, being recorded for, I don't know, as training material for face recognition purposes or something like that, <laughs> you should not look uh, behind you. <laughs> So, so zero, uh, I think you can ignore it. We are way too much here. Okay. Everyone hear me okay? Awesome. First thing I will say is I noticed some of you were in Bern a few days ago, and you'll notice that the slide deck is exactly the same one I presented in Bern. I promise you, this is a different talk. I'm going to use the same slides because I'm lazy. So it's important to say that a lot has been <laughs> said in the last few months. This started as a weekend project. It was a long weekend in Canada, and it's been a very long weekend. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this work was done in collaboration with Vanessa Keeg at the University of Melbourne and Olivia Bray at the um, UC LeBron. And uh, I could not have done um, the work that we've been. We wouldn't have seen the results that we've got with that there. So as some of you may know, my name is Sarah Jane Lewis. Uh, I'm the Executive Director of Open Privacy Research Society. Uh, we are a non-profit society in uh, Vancouver, BC. Uh, we uh, work with marginalized communities to try and build a more consensual world. I'll talk a little bit more about that as the kind of talk goes on. I have a long and weird career, starting off in the British government, doing computer science work, uh, I've worked at Amazon doing automated systems fraud and um, a lot of other weird independent privacy projects you might have read about, like hacking children's toys, hacking sex toys, um, hacking drones, probably others I've forgotten. So I'm going to take you back to February 2019, because this is where it all started for me. I have tried to work out how to tell this story correctly, and I think the only way to do it is to tell it from my perspective, to tell you how <coughs> I learned that there was a country in Europe called Switzerland who was trying to get an e-voting system, <laughs> and how I came to learn that it was very bad. So the first thing that I knew about this was it was a Saturday morning, it was a long weekend in Canada, and I was on Twitter, because that's what I do on long weekends in Canada. <laughs> and I saw a link to a bug bounty, another bug bounty, uh, to some leaked source code relating to the Swiss Post bug bounty. And it was there I learned that Swiss Post had this amazing e voting system uh, that they had, you know, were offering a large amount of money for bug bounties uh, for hackers to attack it. Um, and that they put the entire thing behind a restrictive NDA, <laughs> uh, which personally, as someone who cares about democracy, um, I find abhorrent. And so I started looking at the source code, and uh, if you know who I am and you followed me on Twitter, you will know that I have a very um, sarcastic Twitter account. <laughs> And so, <laughs> and so I, I posted this thread and it started with 
So I took a look at that voting system, and wow. And this spread really spiraled out of control. Um, a bunch of other cryptographers on Twitter uh, started looking at the code, and we started dissecting the various, um, kind of not even the low-level protocols, but just the, the, the system architecture. And all of a sudden, we were receiving comments from Swiss Post, <laughs> receiving comments from Seidel, and there were a number of press releases out. Uh, in particular, there was this one from Seidel, which came a few days later. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I know, you know a lot of you have uh, relationships with hacker circles. I bet a lot of you describe yourselves as hackers, and I know a lot of you will know that when someone says you misunderstand something when <laughs> you're critiquing, it gets under your skin a little. Um, Unfortunately, this is the point where I have to stop telling the story and tell you a little bit about maths, because otherwise the rest of this will make no sense. So, pen and paper ballot systems are great. Um, over the last few hundred years, societies have evolved ways of ensuring that the integrity of our paper ballots um, stays intact. We have poll workers who monitor polling stations. We have um, ballot box checks before the election, <laughs> during the election, and after the election. Uh, we have a chain of custody of ballot boxes as they go from the polling stations to the counting stations. Uh, we have um, observers who monitor every ballot that's counted. We have recount procedures. We have audit procedures. When you move this into the digital world, um, we have to come up with ways of creating that same kind of integrity. And academics, because academics have words for everything, <laughs> describe uh, one of the most important properties of a voting system as universal verifiability. So put very simply, universal verifiability means that anybody can determine that all of the ballots during an election have been correctly counted. That sounds like a fairly easy task. The uh, problem is that because it's a digital system and because we don't trust any one party, uh, we have to come up with some nice maths to um, accurately and succinctly uh, do this processing process. And most election systems, most e-voting systems, on the market today in academic papers use uh, what are known as zero-knowledge proofs. Uh, zero-knowledge proof is a method by which one party to prove they can prove to another party to verify that they know about what you don't care about this. So I'm just going to show you a zero-knowledge proof. So if any of you have ever touched a cryptography or you've ever been subjected to a cryptography lecture before, You'll have met Alice and Bob. Uh, in Zero Knowledge Proofland, we don't talk about Alice and Bob. We talk about Peggy and Vicky. Peggy is a prover, and Vicky is a verifier. And so we can go back to the story now. So after the side will put out their rather nice press release where they said that we had fundamental misunderstandings related to the cryptography, I did what any person would do, and I went and looked at that cryptography. And the first thing I looked at was an all proof. I'm sorry for the maths. So in theory land, an all proof is this really nice mathematical structure. It basically says that if you've got a set of elements, let's say you have two possibilities. Let's say there are two candidates in an election. An all proof allows you to say, I have encrypted my vote. And I can prove to you that my vote is for you know, either candidate A or candidate B. And Vicky, the verifier, can check that my encrypted vote is for candidate A or for candidate B. Um, but Vicky will never learn who I voted for. She doesn't learn the encryption key. So this is theory land. 
Oh, this is some very nice mats. This is what Seidel did. A bit simplified, this a little asterisk. <laughs> <laughs> Can you spot the difference? I'll go back again. Here's what you should do in theory. Here's what Seidel did. <laughs> so it's, so this verifier here, the top two statements involve um, Vicky checking that the challenge that she sends to Alan, uh, she sends to Peggy as part of the proof. She checks that that challenge is, uh, she checks that Peggy has responded correctly. In the saddle code base, um, in the saddle code base, Peggy, uh, Peggy didn't check anything. And so, um, <laughs> and so Peggy was free to encrypt anything and uh, Vicky would accept it as being a valid, uh, a, va a valid encryption. So late on, uh, I don't know what day February 20th was, but you know, after you find something, you want to brag about it, right? So I went on Twitter and I wrote, ah, I think I wrote something about an actual cryptographer, because I am not despite many media portrayals, an actual cryptographer. <laughs> I am a computer scientist, a security researcher, I've written cryptographic tools, but I would not in any way describe myself as a cryptographer. This stuff is hard, <laughs> even for me. Um, yeah, that was at 8.49 p.m. And at 8.59 p.m. <laughs> Got this DM. This DM was from Matt Green, who is an actual cryptographer. <laughs> um, turns out we've broken two completely different things. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was at that point that we decided to team up and uh, try and see what else we could break. Oh, look at this architecture This is what an e-voting system looks like if you want to really get down <laughs> into the system architecture. Nothing on this side matters right now. This left-hand side, that's just a nice front end. We'll get to that maybe later on. Uh, but for now, I want to focus on the back end. Uh, because this back end is entirely controlled by Swiss Post. And that means it's the most critical part of the system. Hackers might try on this front end to you know, do what <laughs> hackers do. Uh, but in this area, Swiss Post are in control. And because Swiss Post are in control, Swiss Post are in a highly sensitive position. If something is wrong in this area, Swiss Post can manipulate an election. They can steal an election. And anyone working with Swiss Post on the system can manipulate my action or steal my action. We want to build e-voting systems where people can't manipulate or steal an election. I keep repeating that because it's important. <laughs> Sorry, more maths. So this bit, the mixing proportion of the, the back end, this is a very important part of e-voting. Because on the front end, the votes come in, and those votes are associated with IP addresses, they're associated with valid user accounts, they're associated with actual living people. And if we just decrypted those votes on the back end and counted them, we would be able to tell who voted for who. And that's a terrible thing in an election system for a large number of reasons. Namely, the privacy means that people can't sell their vote. It means that people can't extort other people to vote. And so we do this thing called mixing, where we shuffle all the votes around, and then we decrypt them. Sounds great in theory. And 
you really want to get into it, this is paper <laughs> called Efficient Zero Knowledge Argument for the Correctness of a Shuffle. And this paper describes a, a zero knowledge proof that allows you to take a bunch of encrypted votes and feed them through a stack of computers called a mixnet. And at each stage of the mixnet, they'll get the encrypted votes, they'll do this process called re encryption which allows them to change what the ciphertext looked like, but still allow it to be decrypted with the same end key. So basically, you're, you're making two ciphertexts look uh, indistinguishable from each other. You don't know if it's the same ciphertext or if it's from a different ciphertext, or if it's from a different code. Um, because of that, we need an efficient zero-knowledge argument for the correctness of the shuffle. We need to be able to test to show that a uh, mixnet hasn't replaced the vote um, with one that um, it itself wants to um, add into the mix. Should have shown this slide because it's much more. <laughs> um, so, yeah, Peggy is giving the set of side facts and she encrypts them. And Vicky wants proof that the new re encrypted side facts are the same ones that Peggy was given. You know, Peggy gets given a bunch of votes that say A, B, C, and out she throws D, uh, D, E, F. And Vicky wants proof that the D, E, F are the same as the A, B, Cs. So to do this, Peggy and Vicky need to agree on a set of generators to build commitments. Those are very cryptographic terms that you don't care about and I don't have the time. So, <laughs> <laughs> so while mixing, Peggy cryptographically commits um, some values to Vicky. You can think of this as Peggy putting some stuff in a box and giving it to Vicky. And then after Peggy's done her stuff, she goes over to Vicky and she opens the box up. And then Vicky can look inside the box and check that Peggy was actually acting honestly. Another way to describe this protocol is if you've ever been to a magic show and the magician gives you um, an envelope like you walk up to the audience and you say, hello, here's an envelope. And then the magician does what a magician does. And at the end of the trick, the magician asks the audience member to open the envelope. And surprise, it's whatever is most astonishing. <laughs> Turns out that's a really good metaphor for what the Swiss post system actually did. <laughs> <laughs> So here's some code. Uh, here's how Swiss Post System generated commitment parameters. And the important thing to understand here is that um, the commitment parameters need to be verifiably random. And by that, we mean that they have to be, there's no way that someone can know a relationship between the generators. Uh, a very basic way to think about this is if you've got a number, um, you have to pick a number such that nobody knows the, the factors to that number. If it's 15, you know, the factors are 3 and 5. We have to you know, pick special numbers that no one really knows uh, the factors to, and no one knows if there's any relationship between those elements. Turns out that's not what Swiss Postal Cycle did. Um, they just generated a random number and generated some generators uh, from those random numbers. Um, which meant that the system knew exactly what the relationship was between all the generators. And because of that, every assumption that we make about the cryptography is broken. So yeah, using these uh, trapdoor parameters, trapdoor is a technical cryptographic term, which also sounds amazing in a headline. <laughs> Uh, Peggy can open the commitments to any value she wants, just like the magician can set whatever's in the envelope to whatever they want, right? There's nothing, there's nothing stopping that trick from happening. And it turns out the maths behind this is really, really simple. Um, all a commitment is is two numbers, um, you know, a, a set A and R. And you can do a if you know the, if you know the relationship between these generators. You can do some very basic swap and replace. It's very simple linear algebra, and work out what whatever you want to open the value to, you can calculate it. And 
can say it, the, the, the summary of this is that Peggy can manipulate votes when she mixes. Uh, there's an example here where if you've got four cipher texts coming in, four votes coming in for candidate one, candidate two, candidate three, and candidate four, uh, Peggy can turn those into, uh, she can replace what the candidate two vote with the vote of candidate three, and thus candidate three has won that election. That's disastrous. <coughs> really want to get into the maths of those papers. And so once you've worked out that you know, you've broken an election, uh, the, the next step is how do you disclose this? How do you tell somebody that the entire premise on which they face their democracy is a lie? <laughs> responsibility as researchers here. Who do we owe this information to? I would argue that we don't owe this information to Swiss Post. We don't owe this information to Cyber. We owe this information to the public who have been using these systems and who may be using these systems in the future. The public deserves to know if their democracy is potentially at risk. And so this, this did create some friction within our research team. Uh, some of us wanted to work with Swiss Post to you know, make be polite. Others of us wanted to uh, go dump this on the media so that one Monday Swiss Post woke up and <laughs> everyone would know how bad their election system was. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> Ultimately, uh, we decided not to sign any non-disclosure agreements, but I did allow my collaborators to contact Swiss Post, be polite as a courtesy, and say, in a week, we are going to the media with this massive vulnerability. Because of these trapdoor parameters, 
No one could do that. You would have a proof that would say it was true, even if someone had manipulated an election. That's a terrifying thing for a democracy, that even the Nats is lying to you in some way. Okay, another segue. Because this is a long story with a ridiculous number of parts. So yeah, meanwhile in Australia, there was an election going on in New South Wales. And New South Wales is a province of Australia that also has e-voting. So it turns out that even though we had thought of these as being completely different systems, the New South Wales electoral um, system was actually just a rebranded um, version of the Swiss system. Uh, they were using the same source code underneath, and because of that, the New South Wales Electoral Commission uh, had to issue a press release saying, oh, oops, that vulnerability that people found in Switzerland actually impacts our election. And um, this was going on during an election. <laughs> Can we also acknowledge here yeah, that Swiss person Seidel knew that their software was the same as the one in the Australian system. And they still opened the stone source code to the world and advertised this huge hacking bug bounty <laughs> during an Australian election. <laughs> Anyway, the identification of the mixnet does not affect the use of iVoting in New South Wales because of an air gap. <laughs> that was in the press statement. An air gap is a fancy computer term for doesn't exist. <laughs> but anyway. And we've talked about this. It's about malicious software providers and administrators who have access to the mixnet. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, we'll come back to that. But even though, even though the identification of the vulnerability doesn't impact them because of a mixnet, Sun is delivering a patch which will be tested and implemented shortly to address the matter. Because that's exactly what you want in your electoral system, especially if you're an Australian, is some random people from a Spanish company coming to deploy a random untested binary patch to your election system <laughs> during a live election <laughs> to fix a bug <laughs> whose primary thing is that you know a malicious person could come in and modify your election. obvious vulnerability in the system if you implement it naively. Because you're not going to give the encryption key to your votes to everybody, right? So without a zero knowledge proof, Peggy can simply decrypt things, look at the result, and if she doesn't like the result, she could lie about it. But when you give it anybody, you don't have the decryption key. So we have a really nice zero knowledge proof that you can do that says here is the decrypt here is the cipher text. Here is the plain text, and I can prove to you that I know a key such that uh, when I decrypt the cipher text, I get this plain text. It's beautiful. It looks like this. In theory land, Peggy constructs a proof. And the cipher text is this form. Now it's going to a message such that she does some stuff, and she puts some random numbers. And Vicky sends this random challenge. This way. 
and Alice does some maths, and then Vicky checks that maths, and this works. Like, if you do it for a minute, right, this works, and it's really cool. So here, to here is this really nice, um, this really nice way of taking this, because in the real world, we don't want to have to do this back and forth, because it's slow, sometimes we're running the prover and the verifier asynchronously, now we want to run the prover at one point and we want to run the verifier later on, especially with auditing election system. People might want to be running all verifiers uh, weeks, months after. So we want to get rid of this asynchronicity and we want to just allow Peggy to do a lot of work up front and then Vicky can check that work. To do this, we thank some nice photographers who came up with this lovely solution where instead of waiting for a challenge, all Peggy and Vicky need to do is agree on a way of generating random challenges. And we do this using a cryptographic hash function, so you may act as a random oracle. A lot of words that make cryptographers laugh. In secure code bases, we have um, ways of doing this. We use something called a transcript, whereby all the public information was associated with the vote, um, the time of day that the proof was um, constructed, the uh, the, the underlying uh, books that are being used, that everything that you can imagine flows into the transcript. And then you just extract a random challenge from the transcript, usually just by hashing the stuff over and over again. If you've ever done anything with computers, you might know about Sharp 56, this is a very basic example. You know, we can take in some very low entropy values like you know, 3 and 10 and 10 and 20 and get this nice random string. And we use the public parameters as input and get unpredictable randomness as an output. The thing that's really, really, really annoying about this is that there is a history of election systems having bugs where they've implemented Fiat Shamir incorrectly in a present. And it has a name, it's weak Fiat Shamir. There's a paper written. <laughs> called pitfalls of the Fiat Chimney heuristic applied to Helios. Helios is an e-voting system. It's in 2012. Not, not kicking you. And so in the silo code base, instead of hashing all the information associated with a given group context, they only hash some of the information. And this has some problems, um, a very, very basic example, heavily simplified, is that if you do Sharp 256 hashing naively, say if you hash 3 and 10 and 31 and 0, you've got no uh, context other contextual information, those produce the same randomness. It isn't random, it's a, it's a deterministic algorithm. And so the, the core point of this is that Given one valid proof, we can produce other valid proofs. And so here's what um, Seidel does. Uh, you might notice that all the asynchronousity is gone, and, and to generate the randomness, um, Alice, uh, see, this is the problem. Peggy hashes uh, just the public key, some output cyber tech stuff, and two random parameters. And then Vicky checks that the, all those are done correctly. <coughs> Problem is, I was going to add a little bit. Peggy can do this math, where she generates a bunch of very specific values. And then she hashes stuff as determined. She gets the, the output, called Z. And then she just changes what the cipher text was as the input. She lies about. Um, part of the cipher text. And so, giving Swiss Post a little last time than we did before, and we published the How Not to Prove Your Election Outcome, the use of non adaptive zero knowledge proofs in the silent Swiss Post and Chat Voting System and its integration with encryption for sounds. And yeah, you, it's, a, it's a nice, successful paper if you want to read like, how bad this could be. And there's another thing that um, this paper answers, which is, remember that wall proof I was talking about that I found that was the thing that kind of got me into this? 
what was the authorish doing in the code base? Because if you look at the, um, the Swiss Post architecture, there is no reason for an authorish to be in the code base. Sometimes authorish are used in certain types of e-voting systems, but in the Swiss Post case, in the i-voting case, there's no need for an authorish. So, you know, I did what any normal person would do, and I emailed Tidal and asked them. And I, at first I asked them, you know, do you agree that this old group is vulnerable? And they said, yep, yeah, you're right, it's definitely vulnerable, which is great. And then I asked, why is there an old proof in this code? And they said, the reason is because inside of our crypto lib, this was initially planned as a library, and therefore, you know, we were not prepared to break it into small pieces. Uh, so while we haven't finished with the refactor, we're including it as a library, because that's what you want in your e system, right? Is unfinished, untested code that's vulnerable, that's not even for the system that you're working on. It's not even that this code is vulnerable. It's not even that, it, it's that it shouldn't have even been there in the first place. Now we come on to the really, really, really fun stuff, which is the vulnerability that actually start e voting in Switzerland. And for that, we need to introduce another concept called individual verifiability. So, as opposed to universal verifiability, where everybody can check that every ballot has been counted correctly, which was broken, individual verifiability is probably where any voter can check that their ballot has been correctly counted. This is an interesting one because it's not actually something that a lot of pen and paper ballot systems have. You know, when you vote on a ballot and it goes into a ballot box and it eventually gets counted, you don't get a note back that says, yep, you have logged the vote for the person that you voted for, or the issue that you voted for. But we do need these in any voting systems because otherwise, people will not trust the voting system. <laughs> and so if you look at the side of documents, this is kind of what individual verifiability looks like. There's some stuff on the front end that happens, and there's some stuff on the back end that happens. And basically, when you vote for somebody or an issue, uh, you'll be given a ticket. And then once the election is done, you can look at your ticket and check that you know, your vote was actually counted correctly. An important side note is that individual verifiability uh, was already required by law in Switzerland. Um, and it was a major selling feature of the in use e voting systems. Very important. Uh, but there is an important point. We just said that the decryption uh, was vulnerable. And in order to correctly count your vote, it has to be decrypted correctly. And so it turns out there was an addendum which came out very shortly after um, the original paper, which showed that individual verifiability in the Swiss Post system was broken. And you can tell I got very lazy if I didn't type it out and I just cut and paste it from the paper. But basically all you you could construct the proofs in such a way like I described before where the proofs would be valid and the voter would get a choice code. And sorry not a choice code. The person would get a, a, a receipt and they could look at that receipt and they could run their algorithms on it and the, the algorithms would tell them that their vote was cast correctly. However, when the vote was eventually decrypted, it would appear to be nonsense. And it would be declared invalid. And it would be only by, you, the only way you would really know this is if you went back through the system and you looked at every single part, and you looked at all the proofs, 
that you, you, you maybe find out where this vote got corrupted. Kind of like, you open a car, and the engine light is flashing. And you're like, oh, it's fine. My car always has a bad engine light. That except for your democracy. <laughs> So in response to these three critical vulnerabilities in our election system, the complete demolishment of their love marry program, <laughs> headlines all over the world, telling the world that the Swiss election system was fundamentally broken. Swiss Post decided their best press release for this was, their ballot box was not hacked. <laughs> but, you know, the subheading there is that Swiss Post temporarily suspends e-voting. Um, There's a line there right at the end that says, therefore, Swiss Post will not provide the e-voting system to the cantons for votes on the 19th of May, the 19th of May, 2019. Sorry for anybody here who was relying on e-voting in the May election. <laughs> but Swiss Post did say that they were very much hoping to have their e-voting system up and running for the October elections. We know how that ended up. <laughs> April, it is April. And you might notice I've not really um, said much about Seidel during this time. We had that kind of back channel where I emailed them and got some information, but they were pretty silent while all of this was going on. <laughs> while one of their systems was getting torn apart in Switzerland, and they had to patch one of their other systems during the election mm -hmm. in Australia. That's the exact time you want your e-voting provider to be very quiet and not make any noise. So they put out on the 1st of April, which is just a great date for <laughs> press releases. <laughs> Seidel said, last week, a vulnerability was found that affects the individual verifiability process used by various Swiss cantons, and they acknowledge the valuable input provided by the researchers who have participated in the initiative, and more concretely, the ones who detected the issues in the source code. But it's me and my collaborators. We have names, but never mind. <laughs> Want to compare and contrast these two? <laughs> so it turns out Seidel wasn't wrong when they published their initial <laughs> press release. <laughs> right? The criticisms were mainly based on misunderstandings related to the cryptographic mechanisms. They just weren't our misunderstandings. <laughs> Um, but Swiss Post 
will not be offering any voting system in the October elections, which I believe are next weekend. This weekend. This weekend. very important to note there is no e-voting whatsoever since years now for the first time thanks to you and also thanks to all the things which happened with the Geneva system so mm -hmm. and so you might read that little headline Swiss Post is going to focus solely on the new system that has universal verifiability Unlike their old system that has individual verifiability that we hacked and broke, they're going to focus on a new system with universal verifiability, which we also broke. But they're going to focus on it, so you know it's going to be good. <laughs> you might be asking yourself, okay, okay. So that was that election in Australia, and they had to patch the system during an election. Surely that had consequences. Surely someone finally said, okay, wait, we have to reevaluate this e-voting thing. We can't be taking down our system in the middle of an election to let people randomly insert stuff into the into the code base. But remember they had that egg act, right? That was going to protect them from this. No external hackers could get in because they have this air cap. And you know, you can trust the New South Wales Electoral Commission, so they'll never modify the vote. So um, you know, fair dues, as bad as the Australian legal system is for studying e-voting systems, they do allow auditors to come in during the election and after the election to look at all the systems and tell you uh, how it went. And they looked at this ag app and they published a report which says, finding, uh, this is not my redaction, finding redacted on ag app to offline computers was not disabled. <laughs> so the, 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 if you're wondering what that means, it means that it wasn't an ag app. <laughs> you can't just say, this thing on our <laughs> Wi-Fi on our egg app computers was not disabled. <laughs> Saying the horn on my unicorn wasn't thrown. Is it egg app because it's a Wi-Fi? I mean, I hear it's Wi-Fi, but I mean it's redacted, so who knows? Because that's what you want in your system, right? It's secrecy in your email. I have opinions on this that I shared on Twitter. <laughs> they published a report that mentioned every single time they had to like, take down their system or do changes. Nowhere in that report does it, does it mention that they put out this press release that said, you know, oh, we're vulnerable to the same thing that the Swiss Post uh, system is. Nowhere in that report do they say they had to, you know, have to have the supplier come in to patch the system during the election. I'm a former security auditor, and I, you know, I have opinions about what audit reports should look like. And if I was running an e-voting system, and you know, during my time running it, we had to do an emergency patch to fix a critical cryptographic vulnerability that could result in us completely manipulating the election, I feel that that's something you might want to mention in an audit report. But what do I know?
as if they've never seen me present, because <laughs> I do not have a script. <laughs> But there are really important lessons to be learned from all of this. And they apply not just to e-voting, but to every single public piece of infrastructure we have, into how we manage and build these systems. And they get to the heart of, like, what are we even doing here? It doesn't matter if it's a water supply, it doesn't matter if it's earthquake monitoring, satellites, or e-voting systems. If they impact the public sphere, they demand public scrutiny. Swiss Post chose to release their source code in, you know, you could guess that they were applying to the letter of the law that said they had to release their that source code, and yeah, nothing prevented them from putting it behind a non-disclosure agreement. That non-disclosure agreement, by the way, uh, that would have allowed Swiss Post to um, ensure our silence um, for 45 days, maybe longer, depending on what light you got to review that non-disclosure agreement. So if we had signed that non-disclosure agreement, I wouldn't be standing here today, and you might be e-voting. <laughs> this weekend. And that's why this is so important. Public infrastructure demands public scrutiny. You cannot just pay a private company to run a private system that determines the future of your democracy. And it shouldn't take a random British girl living in Canada to tell you that. <laughs> or to demonstrate why such non-disclosure agreements are a terrible idea. Also important to say that the math and the implementation of the math are different. Um, One of the things that e-voting systems get marketed as you see this, uh, the silo old stuff, you should see it when you print it out, it's like this high. It's like full of maps, right? And I'm sure, I mean, okay, I'm not sure. I'm actually the opposite of that. Um, I'm sure, I'm sure that that maps have errors in them because we found errors in them, right? We found errors in the de description of how these systems operate that make them fundamentally insecure. But even if those system, that map, that you know, ten thousand pages or whatever of beautifully transcribed mathematics was a hundred percent correct, that says nothing about how the system is actually implemented. You can have the best model in the world, but if you implement in the way that Swiss Post and Silo did, you know how that ends up. That's the reason I'm here in this room right now. I didn't get much sleep during that whole period. Um, me and Vanessa and Olivier were sitting in a slack group chat, and every time one of us went to bed, the other one would probably wake up. Um, I was in Canada, Olivia was in Europe. Vanessa started out in the US, but then flew to Australia during this whole period. Um, I don't think any of us got much sleep, and when we were awake, we were focusing solely on this code. We only touched like 3% of that code base. And we really only looked at the parts of the code base that we knew um, we needed to form the exploits. And that's something I, I don't think I said. Uh, we didn't just sh uh, learn that this was vulnerable and tell us this post that this was vulnerable. We actually people created proofs. We sat, we, we ran, we wrote some code <coughs> that simulated parts of these systems and generated mathematical proofs um, that you could then feed into 
the Swiss Post code. And they would tell you that we didn't cheat, even though when you ran them through the other part of the code, they would tell you that we absolutely did cheat, because you'd see it in the results. So I am an underpaid researcher working for a nonprofit, but I'm still living in academics. None of us have access to tens of thousands of employees, supercomputers. Um, that we can access on demand. None of us have access to, you know, the kinds of infrastructure that actual threat actors have access to. If you are designing a secure election system, you generally do want to stop another country from deciding who your elected official should be. We all know how that ends up. Sovereignty is sovereignty for a reason, right? <laughs> Here's why I do a bit of selling for open privacy. Because fundamentally, I, I describe myself as a privacy activist. I describe myself as a privacy researcher. The nonprofit that I am the executive director of is called Open Privacy. And yet, one of the most important things about privacy is that you have to balance it with transparency when it comes to states and governments. The <coughs> communities that Open Privacy works with LGBT people, sex workers, activists. Doesn't matter if they're in Canada, South America, Africa, the Middle East, China, Eurasia, Russia. The one thing that a lot of these communities have in common is that they need privacy. And the more accurate way of putting this is that they need a way to enforce their consent on their data, on their life. If you look at something like a dating app, the last 10 years have seen this explosion of like mobile dating apps, right? And if you're a queer person living in a very progressive country like Switzerland, that's amazing. <laughs> you have access to a whole community <coughs> a whole dating pool that you didn't have access to 10 years ago. Young people who are you know, growing up in less than ideal homes have ways of coming out that they didn't have 10, 20 years ago. And that applies not just in progressive countries, but in countries like Lebanon, where the legislative and societal posture towards LGBT people is, to put it politely, not ideal. To put it explicitly is fucking horrifying. And if you read work by one of our board members, Norman Chamath, they describe how these dating apps are used in countries like Lebanon and how state actors in, in those countries will abuse those dating apps to find LGBT people, to lure them to environments, to either arrest them or beat them up, sometimes kill them. And that is why open privacy exists, is to build new systems that can extend the wonders that those, those apps have that brought to everyone in the world, to extend that level of consent to everyone in the world. But to do that, we need transparency for governments and for states. We need to demand that power structures are not opaque. And that applies to Lebanon as it applies to Switzerland. Governments don't get to make the rules. 
private companies don't get to make the rules. If we allow them to make the rules, they end up killing people. We know that from history. And so, if you're wondering why a Canadian gal <laughs> running a privacy nonprofit in Canada cares about the Swiss election system, it's because I am very annoyed when governments think they can get away with shit like this. Think they can get away with creating these opaque systems, locking them behind NDAs, telling researchers to be quiet, shut up, don't say, you know, don't tell our vulnerabilities to that. Because ultimately, and the most important thing is that power should be painful. As a private citizen, you can do what you want, right? I am a fairly liberal person to be very <laughs> understated in my political beliefs. But <laughs> if you want responsibility in this world, if you want power over other people, <coughs> that power comes at a cost, and that cost is transparency. That cost is people looking at you and making you very uncomfortable when you screw up because the stakes are high. Yeah, so first announced it wants to offer the new system to Camden's trial operation in 2020. That new system is the same as the old system, the one that was broken. They might patch the, the generator issue and they might fix up the decryption groups. And they might fix some of the other issues that were discovered by other researchers who did sign the NDA. And you don't know that. <laughs> right? Because let me tell you something. There are other vulnerabilities in the Swiss Post system that I'm not going to tell you about today, but that do exist. <laughs> and the only way you can find them is to look at the source code and demand that Swiss Post tell you what they are, to demand access to those audit reports. We can with this hashtag speak math uh, and I really like it. Um, that bit of math in the middle going into the ballot box, uh, that describes the um, equivalence relationship uh, that you need to know in order to generate fraud proofs. Um, in the Swiss Post system, it's on my t-shirt. That piece of math allows you, or would have allowed you, have this system run into operation to steal an election, to steal a Swiss election. It's only because of that maths. It's only because we refused to publish that and to sign that NDA, because we refused to play by the specific rules that Swiss Post had laid out. But you know about it. <laughs> and that that system was never put into operation. So this isn't really the end. As I said, I'm lazy, I reuse slides. But I'm gonna leave this out because of a nice little selling point that Open Privacy is a nonprofit. The work that I did here, I did for free. <laughs> Um, the work that me and Vanessa and Olivia did, that there was no profit motive behind it. We gave up that right when we refused to sign that NDA because of the reasons I described. And we did it because of the reasons I described, because I feel that that kind of transparency, that kind of accountability is fundamental. And the only way that you're going to get more of it is if you support organizations like Open Tell you a little bit about open privacy work. <coughs> I got them all here, and it's my sales pitch. <laughs> um, one of the products that we're working on is called Pitch. Pitch is um, a Welsh word, which roughly translates to a hug that creates a safe space. I'm originally from Wales, which is why we named Pitch. 
And Coach, our vision for Coach is that how many of you in here use Signal? Right? Nice. Like WhatsApp? Yeah. Cool. <laughs> so Signal and WhatsApp use the same underlying cryptography and threat encryption. It is secure. It's great. I mean, Facebook's business model aside. <laughs> But what you can't do with Signal and WhatsApp is extend it. What you can't do is build new applications on top. And what we need in this world is not another messaging app. We don't need another, we don't need another PGP. Um, but what we do need, and what the communities that I work with, what they need are applications that use these, these cryptographic mechanisms that allow them to do more, that allow them to meet other people, that allow them to share their fears privately, that allow them to slowly come out to the world on their own terms, that allow them to hook up with people to learn the fuck and to ultimately allow them to have greater dignity in their lives. And that dignity is not going to come from a corporation. Corporations don't provide dignity, they exist to profit. And I don't know if you know this, but you can't make a profit on marginalized communities because as I've been told by many funding agencies, <coughs> Marginalized communities don't scale <laughs> because they're marginalized. And so that's the reason open privacy exists. It, we exist because no one else wants to focus on these communities. No one else wants to build tools that provide that dignity for the people who really need it the most. And that's why we're building Catch. I haven't said it yet, is a platform like Signal, like WhatsApp, that allows you to do peer-to-peer -peer messaging, allows you to do group chat, but it also allows you to build other applications on top, and we're looking at applications like dating, like anonymous sharing, like shared peer lists. <coughs> and we're currently in the process of working with a bunch of different communities to refine the requirements so that we know what to invest in. And so with that self pitch then, I would love to encourage you to donate to open privacy. I have stickers and I have t-shirts here. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you donate to open privacy today or you do it online or whatever, you can feel free to come grab a t-shirt from me. I would love that. And right now, I will open the floor up to questions and discussions, and I'm sure there's lots that people want to talk about and discuss. And say thank you.
that uh, the roads, uh, their, their name wasn't there. They started an investigation and they even used like DNA samples in the end that, that guy was already known. So they could find him and, and then whatever. I don't see, I mean, if we, if we, if we start to talk about IT security and, and all these attribution issues with, uh, oh, we had a cyber attack, who was it? Uh, let's say it was uh, Putin himself. Uh, I mean, how to go on with such stuff? I don't see at all how you can do it um, sensible for IT. Of course, you can also solve for IT with, with IT, but the evil, evil systems are built, at least the ones with uh, vote secrecy to be held, of course, the ones which are important here, are built in a way that you cannot do forensics in the end. So how, how to solve that one? I mean, this is like a very, <laughs> very fundamental issue. And that's, uh, I mean, despite under understandability, I, I don't know how many people really understood what you say, said here, um, by the way. So I don't even see how people can discuss about if the results are correct. <laughs> That's, that's a point. It's a, yeah, it's a good point, and it really comes down to this idea that so you have like what's it called in this country that you're trying to do right now that I was ranting about yesterday? EIDs. That's the next thing. Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about that. All right. So <laughs> identity system. Right, when you've got identity on the one hand, the idea that you know you as a person exist in society and have you know, attributes that identify you within this society, and then you extend that to this idea of centralized identity repositories, whether they be electoral rolls, whether they be um, government databases of one form. The idea that somewhere there sits a database under someone's control, and that database lists every eligible voter and the, the schemes that are needed for that voter to be able to vote, whether it's you send them a link or you send them a paid ballot. That's a whole other system in and of itself that has its own um, risk management strategies, that has its own potential vulnerabilities, and I don't just mean in the sense that someone controlling that system can secretly add people to the voter rolls, they can take people off, we've seen that kind of manipulation in the US, and we occasionally see it in other countries too, this idea, I mean, it's one of the main forms of voter suppression, is manipulating those roles, right? And so I don't think it's necessarily a, an e-voting problem per se, I think it's a general societal problem that fundamentally we have to balance the risks of someone is going to exploit these systems with the challenge that we all have to live in this society and come to consensus on things. And I think it's important to separate out consensus and the decisions that arise and are acted on because of that consensus. And that's really where I see e-voting as having a future. It's not in perhaps deciding the fate of a nation. It's in allowing larger and smaller groups to come together and rapidly agree on a consensus. Because the alternative to that, and I'm British, is you've seen this Brexit shit. <laughs> <laughs> where we had one vote three years ago and everyone's been arguing about it ever since. That's what happens when you don't have a society that's set up to come to consensus on things. And it's why we need elections and it's why we really do need e-voting. Like, I'm not against e-voting in principle. I know some of you are and you've got very good reasons to be against e-voting in principle. But I would like to live in a world where we can come to these consensuses. And maybe, and we do need, like, I've been using, I've been going to a lot of media this week. My entire week has been, I flew in on Monday. And since then, I've been talking to media or standing in front of an audience or talking to people afterwards, just often enough. And the metaphor that I've been using is the USA going to the moon in 1969. That 
didn't start a couple of years before with someone going, not be cool if we went to the moon, let's go pay that random company to go build some rockets <laughs> and like go to the moon. We'll work out all the flaws as we go along. It was an entire integrated societal effort that involved academics, it involved education programs, it involved uh, military budgets, it involved multiple cross-country collaboration to get to the point where all of those bits and pieces worked and you did something extraordinary. And I really do think e-voting is in line with landing people on the moon. It is that hard, it is that complicated, it requires that level of investment. You know, I know people have scoffed about, you know, I was given children, you know, debt two and a half thousand francs because I can't hold in these systems. Seidel was given a few million dollars to build this system. We really need to be spending billions of dollars on these systems. And those billions of dollars don't, shouldn't go to private corporations. They should go to every other part of that system. They should go to involving researchers and academics and activists in the design requirements, in the risk assessments of these systems. They should go on education programs so that I can stand in front of you and they do understand what a zero knowledge proof is. Or you get to the point where we can have systems that don't require you to have you know, a degree in cryptology to understand how your election system works. And that is why it's a moonshot. And that is why I really, really hope that you know, e-voting doesn't become a reality in Switzerland um, anytime soon, because I do not think we are that. And I really, I, I hate for you to turn into Australia because you've seen how Australia works. And I hope that you don't want to turn into Australia. But, uh, I just say something more and then I give uh, it to others. But I mean, the systems which we used to go to the moon were a way less complex. <laughs> I'm quite sure we wouldn't use current computer systems with all these libraries which no one outed to go to the moon. I probably should try to do that and probably will fail. So this would, this would probably uh, this would probably show that we have like uh, lots of issues to solve and. Uh, this is a good point. Yeah. I'm going to go <laughs> back to wow. Because I think it goes back right to this point, right? It's it's this point. Be big. Yeah. There is a difference between complexity and, sorry, there's a difference between complex and correct. A system can be amazing and beautiful and do a lot of uh, hard things. It can solve hard problems. But if that system is complicated, or you know, a large enterprise Java application, <laughs> you're not going to solve those problems correctly. The reason that I started looking at this, so the reason this whole thing started, was because I looked at that e-voting system and I went, "There is no way this thing is secure because it's too complicated." Because when you if you implement these zero knowledge groups, you get any form of like coding or whatever. You can take some of these zero knowledge proofs and you can write them out and they're actually pretty succinct. Like the math isn't that hard, it's just, it involves understanding the layer of abstraction, right? But you can write these out and they're like 50 lines of code, 100 lines of code. Like you could put it all on a screen or print it all out on like a couple of pages of paper. The Sidewall code base had this 50 line piece of code scattered over 50 different files. Like you would, you would find a value over here. So like if you took, well, uh, so yeah, you have this generic commitment parameters, right? And I actually took the time to write this out. 
So yeah, Alice would pick some randomness in like a piece of code. And then she wouldn't do this Z calculation until like 20 files later. And in between, there was, some blood, and there was a bunch of different boilerplate, some of which was irrelevant. And you can't audit code like that. I've audited large code bases, and I will tell you that when someone is splitting logic across multiple different like, files and packages, and including packages that have no like discernible reason to be in the code, seriously, what was it all for doing in that code? Right. It was, it is overly complex, and that's why I don't think we're supposed to fix the code, right? There's nothing to fix. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's like if you. So one of my latest dreams is like buying a boat and avoiding Vancouver's rent prices, just living on a boat. And it's really cheap to buy. I'll just start. You dream of like buy a boat. The boats are cheap. And you can find them. <laughs> The thing is, you don't go live on a boat that you just found because fixing it up is more expensive than building a new boat from scratch. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that is what the Seidel code base is. It's this rusty old boat that somebody dumped <laughs> in like, in a river. It's like, you, you don't want to face your, your democracy on it. Okay, so I, I stopped to ask the question myself. Who wants? Thank you. But uh, you mentioned uh, transparency, mm -hmm. but how you can expect transparency like uh, when a country like Australia have a vulnerability equity process mm -hmm. uh, with an agreement with the Five Eyes? So in one side we can hide some vulnerability, and on the other side we, share, we say, oh, this is totally secure, don't worry. So maybe one of the points is to fight against this kind of agreement because it goes against everyone, against citizens, against society, against companies, just on the name of strategy of the state. So what we can do about it to first solve this <laughs> problem? Yeah, you have, to, you have to demand transparency, right? That is why we published all the papers that we did. That's why I've been talking to media all week. That's kind of why I'm in Switzerland is because without that, you have nothing. Without that, you have a democracy where someone tells you what the result is. And that's untenable. And as an aside, we do lead by example, Open Privacy as a nonprofit publishes all our financial reports, publishes all our value income statements. Um, we publish every, you know, every bit of money that we spend, we do tell you where it goes. Um, because we, as a privacy organization, we fundamentally believe in radical transparency for people to have responsibility. And we have responsibility. Uh, so beyond the maddening about semantic differences between a system that has errors that, that a malicious administrator can exploit and the system being hacked or hackable, mm -hmm. has this most post tried to provide a more nuanced justification for paying such paying so short of their announced bounty? Or is it that the rest has gone to the other side of the NDA? Uh, so fundamentally, uh, Swiss Post's um, argument around the bug bounty was actually, is this going to be interact? Is that Very important things there, like 
missing HTTP headers, using an outdated version of AngularJS. <laughs> Updated version of the Bootstrap web framework. <laughs> no, on, on this page you won't find anything about the cryptographic vulnerabilities that we found because because the source code was different. It was a different program according to Swiss Post, and thus they didn't have to count it in their PIT statistics. This is what I really know to do. <laughs> I mean, it's a joke, right? You look at this and you go, great. You clearly got a lot for your money and your time and your effort. But I don't know if they have the, like, yeah, so they, they show, like, the, the compensation that was paid here. And I think if you add all of these up, Hundreds of francs, hundreds of francs, hundreds of francs. I think somewhere in here there's, there's, there was like, a, yeah, there's a few that. I'm missing CSP had a cross origin request. Like, maybe you add all those together, I think there are a couple of things, but it's, it's no more than a few thousands of francs. So, I mean, if we remember when Swiss Post advertised this and gave press releases, why is this in this direction? No? Okay. Not that funny. Oh, it's Swiss, too. Okay. Uh, does anyone know how to rotate stuff? We all have the same thing. That's fine. Like, forget about the rotation. Yeah, let's just, let's just do that. Press R. 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 These are the headlines that Swiss Post got for its bug bounty program, right? This is when they announced it. Everyone was excited, and then we were going to test the state of the art system. $150,000 in bug bounties. The system was fundamentally insecure. The system did not offer any security at all. Every aspect of it was broken. Even parts of the systems that had already been used in Swiss elections were broken. There was no universal verifiability, there was no individual verifiability. There should be none of that $150,000 left. <laughs> Where are they actually? Hmm? Where are they actually? The rest of the money. The rest of the money? <laughs> Where is it? <laughs> Just someone has it. Compensation. <laughs> <Yeah. coughs> but yeah, that's the answer to your question. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I want to highlight a little detail. Uh, I mean, we just need to know, just the Swiss people need to know that thanks to you and your team, we can still trust our democracy. And for that, we all in the country need your big thank you, Sarah. Thank you. <laughs> Short so how to bring across a message and 
how to establish trust, and now to convince also the politicians and, and whatnot. Because without that, we can just stop all the digitalization, cyber, something, what call it what you want, and just stop it right there. So basically, I mean, Harinari knows it best. He is being criticized, being populistic. Um, we are critics, uh, we're too critic about the uh, about this, uh, things which should support these uh, efforts and these movements and security is good but it doesn't have to be absolute and blah blah blah. So how to make people think about risks? I mean I know I'm quite paranoid asking my wife but even just much less of my paranoia would be useful for, for society. So how do you approach that? So like this is a new problem, right? We exist in a society with multiple systems that the public has an understanding, and more important, a demand that those systems are secure, right? We have standards around testing our water supply and where the water comes from and how it's done. We have standards on how you build a house. You can't go build a house any which way you want, right? There are expectations that you conform to certain standards of safety and security. If there's a vulnerability, or well, sorry, if there's a safety issue with a car or a baby's toy, there are laws that demand that companies recall that product or you know fix it on their own dime. All of those exist because of public demand. So it's not a case of I think <coughs> letting the public be paranoid. It's the, it's a case of bringing digi the digital world into the same standards of auditability and verifiability that we demand of everything else. Um, something that is worth kind of bringing up on this point, I don't know if I mentioned it, but um, one of the issues that we found was actually found previously, back in 2017. Um, they had audit reports that described this issue. I think it was the generator issue, the first one that we found. And Swiss Post kind of tried to use this as a defense that, oh, we already knew about that. Because <laughs> that makes it better, right? <laughs> that you, you already you knew about it. You didn't fix it, but you knew about it. And that kind of speaks to this idea that there was no culture of safety and security engineering, of quality engineering. And that's the thing that the public need to be demanding. Not, you know, implement perfect zero knowledge proofs. Not like implement, you know, because the, the public don't, and don't necessarily understand how car engines work or how you know, the intricacies of you know, baby toys and what plastics are okay to eat or not, right? <laughs> that's all chemistry and engineering that are complex dynamic fields on their own. But we at least have public bodies that are expected to have experts that understand those things and are expected to run those things through um, quality assurance protocols. And when issues are found, those quality assurance protocols are activated and things happen. All that really needs to be demanded is that those same protocols, those same quality assurance standards apply to public infrastructure that's digital too. Yeah. Uh, I have a question in regards to individual verifiability. Mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering whether the existence of individual ver verifiability is not or cannot in itself be a major flaw because I see the scenario that because you can prove afterwards how you voted by providing the ticket to someone else, it would Often the scenario that someone would start selling their vote, and maybe some malicious action could offer money for the tickets afterwards if people vote in a certain way, or you can blackmail people and then demand the ticket as proof of how they voted. So maybe I don't know if they're working. How much is it in uh, in the shoe in reality? Generally, the way that these protocols work is that you'll get assurance, but you won't get useful assurance. Like you'll, you'll be able to prove to yourself that you, correct, that you voted correctly, 
because you know some information that's only ephemeral. Uh, if you try to go to someone else and take this proof to someone else, they couldn't um, verify it by themselves. And that's what makes it a secure protocol. Um, yeah, for that you need to ask an actual cryptographer. Uh, I'll go read some of the papers. But the, there are protocols that do that do take into account the attacks. And that's why individual verifiability is a, is a security property, because like, they do design election systems that try to avoid um, corruption of those kinds of things. Hello. Uh, did you have any contact with uh, the verifiers? Uh, I think it was KPMG who signed off on the whole thing. Did they manage to get the <laughs> slack or anything? <laughs> Yeah, that was the thing, right? Because one of the things back in this, like, when all this happened and, you know, Seidel put out this press release, and Cisco has published the press release um, in, in comparison to that, um, in at the same time. And one of these arguments was, yeah, that the system's been audited by experts. These experts have shown that the cryptographic. Actually, I'm just going to load up because I, I didn't want to copy and paste this whole press release. But now that you know everything, you'll understand why it's funny. So. <laughs> These cryptographic protocols were the result of research carried out by Seidel in 2001 which have been made available through the public through ongoing academic publications. They have successfully passed the scrutiny of third-party cryptographic experts. And it is indeed because the cryptographic protocols have achieved complete verifiability that the source code has been published. I love this bit. <laughs> <laughs> With the confidence that no attack might compromise the secrecy of the ballot box or the integrity of the election results. Talk about a statement not aging well. <laughs> I thought it's still on their website. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what do you say? This whole thing is absurd. I, I've done a lot of re weird research, right? I started off, I wrote a tool called Onion Scan back in 2015, 2016, that was looked into dark web websites, looked at dark web drug marketplaces. You know, I've talked to a bunch of people who run these sites. You know, I have contacts in those worlds. I have hacked sex toys. Um, I have a lot of friends in the adult industry, in the sex work industry. And you know, I've hacked children's toys. I have you know, intercepted drone communications from midair. I've um, spoofed child tracking devices so that the child appears to be in a completely different place than when a parent sees them on their app. <laughs> All of that is fairly normal compared to this world of e-voting, where you've got this e-voting supplier that is so confident in their election system that they will publish press releases like this, and that they will publish their source code behind some weird ideas, but they'll publish their source code. And, the, but and then it turns out that this election system is less secure than just kind of having a database run by someone who you tell them how you vote and they tell you what the result is. Like, if the system had been a MySQL database hosted by Swiss Post, it would have probably been more secure and provided better security guarantees than the highly complex system they developed. Like, I thought a bit about zero knowledge proofs, and there are a lot of zero knowledge proofs in e voting systems. Every single zero knowledge proof implementation in the Swiss Post code base was broken. Not just one, not just two, not just a handful, every single one. It wasn't that they made some mistakes in implementing some, it's they implemented everything wrong. They didn't implement anything right. They didn't implement anything right. Their entire company, all they do, what we do, we power democracy. <laughs> we build e-voting systems. That's all that company does. They didn't implement anything right. 
<laughs> and they've been building these things since 2012? They prove they have zero knowledge. Is that what they <laughs>
nonprofits like open privacy exist and are structured in the way that we are because I firmly believe that it's, it's this is a Marilyn Manson quote, which is kind of weird. <laughs> Marilyn Manson has this quote where they say, it's impossible to change the world, you can only build something new within it. And I think if we really do want to live in societies where we have systems that work for the people, that are not um, encumbered by the biases of existing systemic um, instances, then we need to invest in, those, in new structures and new systems that bring those things about. Um, open privacy exists because no one was doing the work that we were doing, and so we decided to build it. And we didn't really have a funding model or a, a business plan. And things are working out so far. Um, and it's really one of those things where I don't really have an answer to how we build systems that are robust and transparent and that work for the people without just saying, you have to go build it, you have to start somewhere. And there are going to be missteps and there are going to be problems and challenges on the way in terms of try. I, I probably submitted a grant to every government um, and corporate fund <laughs> that has a grant. That, you know, and if, you know, the moment you say you want to build apps for sex workers or queer people, most of them show you the door, <laughs> right? Because no one will fund that kind of work. The only people who fund that kind of work are people. Um, the only reason open privacy exists is because there are enough people in the world who think open privacy should exist and who donate to us to make that a reality. And so it, 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 you need movements you know, like the e-voting moratorium initiative, you know, people who say, this is a problem, and right now the only way I can think about solving this problem is that we stop. <laughs> that we think about it for a while, long time. And really, in the context of the universe, five years isn't a long time. And so, yeah, that's my answer. <laughs> it's, yeah, you can't rely on states to do this. You can't rely on supposed to do this. You can't rely on societal to do what's right. Because we know what societal thinks about themselves, right? We know what supposed thinks about themselves. The only people who are really going to make effective change are you people. <laughs> the people who live in Switzerland and who, who care enough about the society that they live in to want to make it better. Um, we discussed about it briefly before, but um, I'm quoting now a press release of the 24th of July of CYTL called Seidel's paper, Green Transparency and Trust to Elections Using Blockchains <laughs> for the Transition. Oh, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> Maybe you can repeat your answer in public. <laughs> yeah, they, they did this thing with Ethereum soft contract, I think it was. Um, don't implement an e-voting system on the blockchain. They're two different problem sets. It's, you wouldn't build an oil refinery on top of a car, right? <laughs> 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 yep, oil refineries and cars have distinct purposes and could be useful in the world. I'm a fan of blockchains, mainly because that pays my, you know, that pays my rent. Uh, the majority of open privacy uh, donations come in the form of like bitcoins and cash. Um, it turns out a lot of people from those communities really do care about the future of privacy in uh, But yeah, like a, a blockchain is not a good model for building an e-voting system on. It's not even. It's not even. It's a. Good, it's not even a good one. You could probably build an okay election system on a blockchain. It's just that it's kind of premature to start thinking about building election systems on a blockchain. We don't really know how to build election systems for the start, right? It's yeah. <laughs> I like my oil refinery cars example. So I'm just sticking that. 
how do you present your systems to the world. It's not under the sphere of a nonprofit. Um, they need to have their own branding, their own identity, something that people can relate to. Thankfully, we now have a few decades of um, active experience and case studies of what works and what doesn't work in the online world, and we will be actively exploiting that to get people to care about these issues and get people to using the software. Because this kind of software is only secure if lots of people use it. I think at least awareness is being raised a lot. I said it in the beginning with this Cambridge Analytica stuff, with this Facebook antitrust things going on. So I don't think that these big centralized companies have a future in the long run. And if people are here who have enough money or ideas how to decentralize things, I think we should, we should just team up. I mean, I'm also in projects like that, speaking with, uh, if you know them, there's a lot of Moonet, Net Foundation also uh, finances such projects. So I think um, we should try to work more together because it's, there are too many small things, and I think the interoperability is not yet the topic there. Yeah. Should be so uh, everyone should try to who is doing such stuff, such stuff should we should try to, to have like a, a, a discussion for there, there were by the way several initiatives like we fix the net and uh, such things um, that was more for the new net people I'm not sure what your take on new net for example which also is like a decentralized peer to peer framework but probably it's not the right. We'll go into that in the yes, program. <laughs> <laughs> I will say is, I have stickers here that open private share file. Feel free to come back. And if you want to share, come see me. If you've pre ordered the shirt on IMP and I go to the I probably have a bag here with a t shirt in if you want to get it. Um, but yeah, I think, well, right now, thank you so much for coming. Uh, have a